And then the resilience piece, I was thinking, um, I mean, this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. And so after um, my bachelor's, I took a year off and just worked at the bank. I worked at Regions Bank in Crichton. So y'all, welcome to Tea Time with Leticia on Gratified Grad, where it's my goal to help you graduate with gratification. Today's tea is a mix of, and let me just read this again. It is a mix of sarsaparilla root. I've had sarsaparilla root before, but I like to add mint to everything, so I just added some mint to, you know, see what it tastes like, and it's okay. It's not too bad. I think I would like this sarsaparilla root by itself and be just fine. And with that, I am going to let today's guest introduce herself and her tea. Hi, <laughs> I'm Brittany Lynn, um, and my tea is kava. Um, like I put a lot in here because I was rushing. So it's kava, uh, chai, um, lavender, and uh, a little bit of pea protein because uh, it's my lunch time. <laughs> that is fancy. <laughs> that is a real time. tea blend right there. So what is kava? So kava is that uh, is kava kava root, and it is for kind of stress relief and uh, relaxation. It's not as strong as I prefer it, like when I got it at tea shops in times past. Um, maybe I could check out belladonna herbs, but it's really just uh, to help relax. It's very nice as a cold, like iced tea, as well as a hot tea, and it has like a tangy flavor. Um, so I like it. Hmm, that's interesting and good to know. I have to try some kava and I definitely have to get some pea protein. Yeah, so just for stuff, so. Hmm? so dairy upsets my stomach and whey protein is um uh you know a byproduct of dairy. So makes sense. I just learned something new today. Thank you. So what high school did you go to? Uh, I went to Murphy High School in Mobile, Alabama. Yes. Shout out to the Panthers. <laughs> oh, seven. <laughs> I'm 32. I'm a PhD candidate at Penn State University um, and communication sciences and disorders. So I just do research, um, more basic science, not, uh, nothing too clinical at this point. Um, I don't have any clinical certifications, but I do research and speech processing um, and noise, noisy background. So how other people understand uh, the person they're talking to when there is something interfering with uh, them understanding that message. So sometimes when I'm on my video chat, uh, the landlord is here mowing the grass or doing construction and it doesn't phase me because I hear it all the time. But then the other person on the other side of the video is like, <laughs> we can't hear you. So um, I just kind of study things like that. Interesting. So does a lot of your work revolve around um, hard of hearing and deaf individuals? Well, um, a lot of my work can be applicable and have implications for hard of hearing and uh, deaf individuals. Um, but I've only done research on populations that are neurotypical adults, uh, mostly within the community at, at State College or when I was in Kansas there or New Paltz or wherever I've been. And so when I go into my postdoc position, hopefully, um, I'll get more training and expanding my uh, current research into populations who are uh, um, deaf. What has been very helpful to you being a student, to you staying a student, to you like persevering through everything that comes along with being a student and ultimately helped you get to graduating because you're pretty close to finishing? 
first off, I guess my first thought is it's a lot of different things that, that really um, have propelled me to this moment here. Um, but the most, the thing I've done the most is like that resilience, that perseverance and being able to network. Right, and I think that those two can go hand in hand. So, um, just thinking about um, being able to network is important because a lot of the opportunities you might hear about are within communities um, at your institution. If you're if you're wanting to get a PhD or something like that, even starting an undergrad. So, going to conferences, even if you don't have a presentation yourself. Um, even being in little organizations and within your own department, so local or national, um, and then just talking to different people, not only in academic social, uh, social, uh, academic circles, but also social circles is what I was meaning to say. Um, and then opportunities will arise that you didn't even know, I think, about and kind of be, uh, more... I don't know, I guess maybe more motivated to do it because it gets you to where you wanna be and it'll help you there. And then the resilience piece I was thinking, um, I mean, this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. And so after um, my bachelor's, I took a year off and just worked at the bank. I worked at Regions Bank in Crichton. And then <laughs> shout out to all my people there if you're seeing this here. <laughs> Um, and then I worked at Belk. Um, so this was in Mobile, Alabama, my hometown, because I went to University of South Alabama um, for my undergrad. I got my degree in psychology and I have my de degree um, and my master's degree in psychology as well, but it's cognitive psychology. And so I know I'm backtracking a little bit, but this is something I meant to say when you asked me about um, the populations that my research involves, including deaf and hard of hearing. So I'm in communication sciences and disorders because mostly when I was getting my degree, I was looking at my master's and my undergrad, I was looking at cognitive psychology. So still speech perception and processing, um, more basic science, but CSD as a whole and speech language pathology um, is wanting more basic scientists to come in to help with implementation of interventions, for various reasons. Um, same with audiology. So, well, I think. So that's kind of my background there. So that's why I haven't really had uh, work that involves directly um, these populations. Dynasty talked about the importance of networking. And um, though she talked about it, um, more in the directive of these are the steps and things that you need to do in order to network. Okay. Um, I think that in this conversation, we're talking more about how does the networking pay off in yeah. what you do in the future. Yes, um, I agree. I mean, I don't even, so networking is so easy for me just because I talk, talk, talk. And I'm just like, if they say no, they say no. <laughs> so this is my thing, you know, like that's the worst they can say is no. Um, so I just really go up to people and talk to them <laughs> and ask them and try and see where the conversation goes. Even um, when it comes to one thing that I liked that when I was a first year PhD, so I didn't start out here. Oh, it doesn't matter. So when I was a first year PhD, I was in um, these pro seminar classes and we had to make a mentor map. And our mentor map had to have people not only within our discipline, outside of our discipline, professional um, people, uh, professional people within our discipline, outside of our discipline, then just anyone to review our writing and um, help us with professional development and all these things. So we just had to make a mentor map. And I think that something like that really does help you open up your mind to, hey, it's not just my mentor that can help me. It's not just, you know, so-and-so in the department or maybe even in the Center for Language Science, but I can go outside of that. I can say, hey, like you may be able to look over some of my writing. So maybe I could ask you like, hey, would you be willing to look over my writing, you know, at when it's 75% ready and edited? So right. 
I don't know. I think networking is just, you're right. The payoff is amazing if you can do it. And I think it's academia. academia. I think networking is academia. And that's why some people might want to get out of it or maybe, you know, are having a harder, harder time. And that's why for women, it's kind of harder. And for women of color, even harder. I just feel like it's, it's harder because there's still, there are still these ideals that people are working off of and expectations and um, kind of biases that are written into tenure and promotion mm -hmm. um, and what you need to do as a uh, early career professor or early career researcher. Um, but slowly but surely those things are changing. And that's one other thing that's like, okay, like I've always been like, if we are in these positions, when I say we, I mean like black women, black people, black and brown people, then for grads and little people, they can see the little children and stuff. They can be like, oh, I can do that too. And then we can help with those opportunities. So what does resiliency look like for you? Gosh. Okay. I would probably like, just to maybe give you some time to think about and get you started, but you've already mentioned uh, one part of what resiliency is for you and saying that, you know, you just go talk to people, right? And, you know, you know that no is not the worst thing that can happen. So you have no problem going up and starting a conversation and seeing where it goes. What else is an example of how you are resilient? Okay. Um, the one thing that comes to mind uh, is, uh, was it two semesters now? I feel like the coronavirus has just changed my concept of years. But I was in my uh, office and I was like so upset. And I was just like, ah, I'm tired of, I'm tired. What did I say? I was talking to my mentor. He like came, to, he was knocking at the door or something. And I was saying to him, I said, I'm just, I'm tired of uh, overcoming. That's what I said. I said, I'm tired of overcoming. I'm just tired of overcoming. I was like, why can't something just be like simple? Like why can't anything in my life just be simple? And so resilience is not just, um, you know, the prior piece, but for me, it's really being able to pick things up and be flexible and keep your eye on the prize, so to speak, and what you want to do, even when it's not, you know, um, uh, what is it, like sugar spice and everything nice kind of thing. Right. Um, so being able to be told, like, I mean, PhD, this is why I tell undergrads a lot. It's like, you're going to be told that you're a failure all the time. Like you're the top in your class in high school, you're the top of your class in undergrad. And when you get into PhD, that's your in the PhD with a lot of people who are the top of their class. And then you have professors that are trying to train you not to, um, you know, absorb knowledge and make a good foundation like an undergrad, but you're getting to where you're going to be creators of that knowledge. And so if you have an idea that isn't great, then they're like, no, this isn't a great idea. And so you're kind of just told that you're failing a lot. I mean, you're not actually failing like getting F's, but just like, oh, that wasn't, oh, this isn't a great idea. We could fix it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, that feeling of failure. Though yes. no one has actually said you failed, you still feel as if you failed in some type of way because you're not moving forward. Yeah. And even if you are moving forward, you don't, it's like, it's like, a, it's like you feel like you don't see it till later. Like right. people are like, no, right. like, you should see like, you know, my mentor is good at this. He's like, Brittany, think about how you were your first year master's when you did your five minute spiel of research. And I didn't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> this is back yeah. in 2013, y'all. So. My advisor and I had a recent conversation of, um, you know, my first year, I gave her a writing sample. Mm -hmm. And she was like, you know, based on that writing sample, I questioned whether or not you would <laughs> make it as a graduate student. <laughs> but clearly, I'm still a graduate student. 
Yeah, and then and five years later, so. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just a lot of things like that, right? So for me, um, like sometimes people ask me what my name is and I'm like, Brittany Williams. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's not like snap, crackle, pop, like fast. Um, so there are things that I know for a fact, 100%, and then it just takes me a minute to recall. And so that is something that I have worked on, you know, and in terms of disseminating my research and having other people understand kind of what I'm talking about. And, um, yeah, so that's just one of those things. Uh, and then there's something that you said that brought a thought to mind in terms of resiliency that I can't remember what it was. The only other thing that I want to say about resiliency is for a while and kind of still even now I'm not a big fan of being called resilient or being called strong um, I understand that that is how like I'm perceived for sense. all that I do and things like that but um there's this there's this like idea of you know wow like you are just amazing because you can do this when in actuality I'm not amazing because I can do this I'm just amazing and I, I and I use the word amazing loosely right because there are plenty of people who are just as smart as me or smarter and just didn't get the same opportunities that I got and the luck of the draw, you know, maybe looks, maybe who I networked with. I mean, it's so many different factors that play in there. But this idea of saying, you know, I'm so resilient. I think every person is resilient in their own way and with the things that they truly want and truly care about. Okay. I was, I was raising my eyebrows at a point when I said, when you said every person's resilient, I was like, well, <laughs> if they're still living, I think every person is resilient towards something. Yeah, exactly. So when you put that, that caveat, I was like, okay, yeah, definitely. And so, I mean, yeah, so that's the other thing too. So the one thing I was thinking resilience, but the other thing that I was starting to talk about, then I got off way off track when I took a year off after my undergrad and just worked jobs to see like, okay, do I really want to do this? I took the GRE, applied to schools, and then I was just making sure that, hey, this is what I want to do. So I applied to master's and PhD. Um, my PhD program was like, everything looks great, but you need higher GRE scores. Um, so call, you know, like reapply. Um, and then I, but I got accepted into a master's program and, I, and it was really great. And I thought, this will, this is good. I can do the research I want to do. Um, so I started there. Then, so yeah, so then after my master's, I took a year off still. And I was doing like, I love the, re the research question I chose is my research question. It was my like, I want to do this, you know, and nobody forced me to do it. It wasn't like an offshoot of something that was already happening. And I had a great, amazing results and feedback. And so I decided that I was going to do a volunteer year of research off to, to really see, like take the time to see, do I really want to do a PhD? Should I go into just being a researcher or a lab technician somewhere? And I did. And so after all that, I'm like 100% sure that this is what, the only thing that will make me happy and what I want to do, except for my side dream is um, being a sound engineer off Broadway and for film. Oh, but yeah, perfect. so you can't have resiliency, like you said, you can't have resiliency for something that you don't want to do. So it's right. the things in your life that you know that you want. And for me, it's this. Since fifth grade science fair, I wanted to be um, an emerita professor of psychology. At the time, it was of psychology. But um, I've gotten to a point where I discover that there are so many different kinds and uh, tracks in psychology. And mine is like cognitive psychology, kind of speech perception, speech processing. And so I might want to be an emerita professor or emerita researcher. I don't know. But I wanted to do this for so long. And I made sure along the way that I still wanted to do it. And not just that it was something that I told myself, I'm going to do this and no matter what. <laughs>